Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, exciting webinar that uh, we're about to get underway in partnership between Mass Participation World and World Sports Group. I'm uh, really looking forward to uh, having this great session over the next hour. Let's get underway. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Chris Robb. I'm the CEO and founder of Mass Participation World. Delighted to be partnering with World Sports Group tonight. Um, and Charlotte Melchard, who's the founder and CEO. Do you want to turn your camera on and say hello, Charlotte? Wonderful to have you join us. Hello there. Thank you for that introduction, Chris. I'm so excited to hear that we have so many attenders tonight. Really yeah, great. really looking forward to the session. We've had over 200 people registered, so clearly your idea is a wonderful one. There's great interest uh, in this, and let me read the topic uh, to make sure I get it absolutely right. Global reach, local impact, master the art of attracting international participants. Uh, really looking forward to the session. We have one hour allocated, um, and the way we're going to break it up, we're going to. I'm going to do a little piece on the Mass Participation World MPW 23 conference coming up in Ho Chi Minh City in just three weeks' time. Apologies, some of you may have seen that on the World Athletics webinar, but bear with me just uh, for those that haven't. We're then going to come back to Charlotte, who's going to do a presentation um, on the topic. And all the way through, uh, as I mentioned, there seems to be a problem with the chat, but put your questions in the Q&A um, if they are relevant to a particular section. I will um, invite uh, Charlotte just to stop her presentation and answer those. Otherwise, we'll do them at the end. We are live streaming on Facebook and we are recording, so we will make the recording available. We're also live streaming into China. Thanks again to our friends, Julia and Jerry from CGX Management. Uh, the presentation will be available afterwards and we will also be putting up a number of polls as we go through. So um, if you wouldn't mind, just I'll pop them in, um, give us your response. It'll help to inform uh, the conversation. But I think that's all of the housekeeping. So let me get underway. I'm just gonna do a, a screen share uh, with the presentation here. So yeah, just wanted to do a, a quick share on the MPW, eighth edition MPW conference coming up in Vietnam in exactly three weeks time. In three weeks time, we will be at the end of day one. Uh, we're offering $50 off for anyone who joins today. There's a QR code there um, or anyone who signs up after today, just use um, MPW2350 when you register. Um, so the theme is future proofing from the grassroots up. And for the first time in the eight years of the conference, I'm really excited to be bringing grassroots sport along to the program. And I guess the question some may be asking is, is why grassroots sports? I've been asked for many years how I define mass participation, and, and I've always defined it along the traditional pillars of the likes of running, cycling, triathlon, obstacle racing, and so on. And, and I had this realization over the last few years, if 10,000 people running a half marathon or a 10K or whatever is mass participation, why isn't 10,000 kids and adults playing amateur soccer mass participation? And then I drill down further and I see what I believe are a lot of similarities. We all, both of the sectors deal with managing outdoor events and the challenges, challenges with that. We have a huge reliance on volunteers. We have similar business models where maybe in, in grassroots sports, you substitute entry fees for subscriptions or maybe entry fees if they're running a tournament. We're very much reliant on building and engaging with communities. And I think really importantly, what underpins the work that we do is we create a huge impact on the health and well-being of citizens. So for those of you that have attended MPW in the past, you will realize that I always try and get us to look over the fence bring speakers from other, uh, from other segments and really excited to be bringing some speakers specifically from grassroots this time round. Um, some of the key elements of the program, over 35 international speakers, I'll share some of those with you later, very focused on conversations, not presentations, so a pretty much PowerPoint free zone. We've got a, a new format with a couple of interactive hour long workshops on a couple of key topics, uh, future generations and the business model being two of those. We have, uh, as always, a half day innovation and technology section uh, in partnership with GSIC powered by Microsoft. We'll be launching an MPW Future Leaders program. Uh, lots of networking. Uh, there'll be a, a short bus transfer from our hotel to the venue. So we've uh, created a concept called bus working where people will have the opportunity to stand up and do their elevator pitch for a couple of minutes to those on the bus with them. Uh, we're part of Ho Chi Minh City Tourism Week. 
Um, we have the opportunity to attend built into the schedule, the um, opening of the, uh, the eight Ho Chi Minh City International Marathon, and then the opportunity to join that event at the weekend on the Sunday, if you're so inclined. Um, just a couple of quick things on the key session. So we've got a great session on paddle. Some of you may or may not have heard of paddle, but it's officially the fastest growing sport in the world. And I think there's many things we can learn in, in traditional mass participation. We've got a segment on the role of governments and federations in grassroots, particularly mass participation and grassroots sport. Volunteers of the future, grassroots sport is a movement. Destination Vietnam, it's a really burgeoning industry there. Lots of things happening, particularly from a supplier perspective. Those coming in will be interested to see. We'll talk about Generation Next, our next participants. We'll talk about purpose-led risk, uh, building and launching new concept. We have a couple of great case studies that we'll be sharing there of new concepts. Uh, AI, obviously very topical. We've got um, uh, Amazon Web Services coming to talk to us and a number of others about the role of AI. Uh, preparing for the increasing impact of climate change with case studies there, uh, crafting a sustainable business model and ecosystem. Um, these are some of the speakers we've announced. We've been announcing week by week a couple of the key ones there. Um, Scott Levy on the right, the former head of the NBA in Asia. Alessio Punzi, probably known well to many of you. Caroline Darcy, the former global head of sponsorship for Standard Chartered Bank. Um, on this slide, Mike Nishi from Chicago Event Mar uh, Ma Management, uh, Taylor Host, who many of you would know from uh, his days at Miro AI, and Carol Cunningham, who heads up volunteers globally for Parkrun. Uh, and then the ones we've just announced today, Mr. Lim Tech Yin, the former CEO of Sports Singapore, um, Tim uh, Godfrey, who's joining us from Paddle, um, and um, Julia Chui, who many of you would have uh, come across from China, giving us a China perspective. There's the QR code. Um, just give it a quick scan if you would like to get access to the website easily and uh, take that $50 off. But that's enough from me. Uh, delighted I'm about to turn my camera off. I'm welcoming uh, Charlotte back to the stage, the virtual stage. I'm going to uh, hover in the background and uh, hand it over to you, Charlotte. As I said, please, if you have any questions on the way through, pop them in the Q&A. The chat is disabled for some reason, and I'll be picking those up either at the end of the show or, or uh, as we go through. Over to you, okay. Charlotte. Thank you, and super exciting topics for the upcoming conference. Um, Today, I'm going to share a topic that we are very passionate about, which are international participants. Um, I will just start by explaining a bit on what we are doing and uh, very shortly about our business. Not many know that we actually operate two separate platforms. So we have Ahutu, which is the biggest endurance cal calendar globally with 27 endurance boards. And then we have World Marathons, um, where we feature running events all over the globe. Our aim and the main target with our business is to grow this industry. We believe that there is huge potential in getting more to discover the thrill of uh, entering entrance events. And today I will try to summarize and pick up some of the learnings we have had over the years when working with international participants. But I will also share four cases um, on events that I believe do really well in this area. Every month we reach approximately 1.2 million um, visitors and they come from all over the world. So we even have uh, visitors from small countries like Cuba, even North Korea coming to us. And they also book events through our platform. We list 40,000 events and try to enrich the calendar every week with new events and add data to existing events. We do not only promote events in our own channels, so Ahuto and World Marathons. Uh, since August, we are also uh, promoting the events in Garmin. And this gives a fantastic opportunity for organizers to reach their 60 million uh, user base. Um, you only have to enter and maintain the data in one place, and we'll take care of uh, making sure that it 
is displayed in a great way in all these different channels. And we also do digital marketing for tourists, promote them in social media, do newsletters and many other things. Um, important to stress, we are not a registration system. We happily work with your registration system and we provide bookings on top of the main registration. We work really hard to cater for an international audience, which means that uh, checkout is in many different languages. Um, there are also many local payment options. And uh, we wanted to make sure that it's really convenient and fast to find a race and make a booking through us. Now let's come into the main part of this webinar, how to master the art of attracting international participants. And I would like to start by just briefly analyzing who are this mysterious group of international participants. Even if they're coming from all over the world, they have some things in common. They are high net worth individuals. They need to have the, the money to invest the time uh, to practice Andrews. They also tend to travel within their own continent, even though that's a huge area. So you don't have to um, look for international participants really, really far away, but you can also look in your neighboring countries to find these audiences. A larger portion are traveling with friends or family. Now it's 60% uh, of our users. And uh, then they really care about the offers for the people they bring with them to the event. They stay for a long time, 80% stay for more than three days, and then they combine the event with a vacation or with a business trip. And they tend to book events early. So this is a main pitfall for events that want to wait a long time before they open their registrations that they might miss on this group of internationals. Because they need to arrange with uh, the practicalities, coordinate with friends and family, and maybe also uh, get a visa approved. So start registrations in time is the main advice here. Um, one other quite fascinating thing is how often they participate in events. So the international group, 90% um, in this group join more than two events a year. And astonishing, 15% join more than 11 events a year. This means that they have um, participation in both global events, international events, but also local ones. The needs of international participants is slightly different from local ones. What they in particular value in an event is the experience, as you can imagine. They travel often quite far, they spend a lot of money on this event. So they want to come back with something really cool, something to tell their friends, um, something unique. They also tend to care more about sustainability um, factors, and this can help the event uh, in or affect the event in a way that you should um, care more about waste management, maybe offer vegetarian food, have more of a sustainable component in the race. They also value convenience over the price. So if you can help an international to easily get to the event, to find accommodation and so on, they, they will value that a lot and then the price doesn't matter that much. Something that they don't care so much about either is the charity parts. They might care about that in their own home country, but when they go abroad to participate in an event, that is not a, a factor that makes them decide over one event compared to another. Looking at this group is quite particular, and it also means that it's much more demanding than a local audience. 
But on the other hand, they bring a lot of value, not only to the event, but also to the local community. And I wanted to touch upon some uh, things that the internationals bring. Uh, brand wise, um, what we have seen is that events that do attract um, international runners or athletes, they tend to be perceived to have a better quality all in all than events that doesn't. They can also help to attract sponsors, especially if you target international sponsors. On the actual race day, the diversity that international bring can also help to boost local participation. And revenue wise is a great audience. As I said, they tend to value convenience, which means that you can sell on many add-on services. They also want to explore the area. You can have other services that they will value and, and buy. And last but not least is the city and uh, or local community element. Internationals can help to lift um, a whole region or city and uh, put them on the map as a tourist destination. And they have great impact on um, the local businesses. And uh, when you see different service being done of the big events or small events, the, there's a true impact of uh, the international audience. Charlotte, I've just, I might jump in there because it's relevant yeah. to the section you just put around uh, sustainability. And <clears throat> Julia's put a question in, how do the international events evaluate the sustainability level of the events? Does a Hutu provide ranking or index? Very good question. It's something we have thought about doing because we can see um, if we read the reviews and when we hear back from, from participants, it's really something they value. And on the other hand, if if the event doesn't live up to it, they can really spread a negative uh, word about the event. So we have thought about that and it could be a really good tag or element to add in the future. So a good point to have it in, in the site. Thanks, Charlotte. And just a reminder again, um, unfortunately, for some reason, the chat's disabled. So if you do oh. want to ask a question or communicate, please do so in the q and I'm, I'm sitting here monitoring those. Thanks, back to you, Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Looking at the macro level and where the world is at this point, even if there are many negative things happening in the world now, as we know, um, both from uh, inflation and, and horrible wars going on, the tourism is actually going up. And there is a rebound now in the world tourism, and it's almost back to 2019 peak levels. More interestingly for our industry is that the area that grows the most is what's something called value-based experiences. In that sector of the tourist industry, you have sport events and wellness events and so on. So the future looks really bright um, for our industry when it comes to driving tourism and this runcation concept. We took the liberty to play a little bit with uh, Kotler's uh, 4P marketing mix model and created a framework that we hope that you can find useful when you evaluate your event. And if there are areas where you could improve as a race organizer. Um, it's a very simple uh, framework. Um, we have the product side where we have the risk experience, what's happening before the risk and after the risk. Um, the partners that you uh, find, tourist board sponsors and so on, the people you work with, the promotion mix that you use, the profile and branding of your event and the price. A really good event don't have to master everything uh, in this slide, but rather find a balance and at least consider all of these elements from an international participant's point of view. Um, something that takes, um, that distinguish a great event from maybe a less well-performing event is that they find a few of these areas and they focus on them and make them really well. So that's what I would like to cover in the key section.
something to remember and some key takeaways and let's say pain points that we have seen over the years. An event really doesn't have to be premium to attract internationals. On the contrary, we have seen a trend where international runners can appreciate more rustic events, more low cost events. Um, so premium and internationals don't go always hand in hand. Even if this group is less price sensitive than the locals, um, you have to try to stay away from being greedy and charge a premium to an international just for the sake of it, because you have to, in the end, deliver something. Also, when some events they tend to have one price for internationals, which is much, much higher than the local runners, that can be fine, but then be prepared to offer something extra to the internationals. It can maybe be a little guidebook when they arrive or just some extra services that so that they feel that they get value from the event. And then when you decide on the profile of your event, make sure that it shines through everything. If you select to have an echo profile of the event, then everyone should be aware of that. And you also need to reflect that in the sponsors that you select in the race day venues and so on. The same if you have a more of a premium profile that should also be reflected in all these areas uh, in the model. So hopefully uh, this could be used as um, a discussion, a uh, base of discussion for your team. And you can find areas where maybe you do really well already today or areas where you, you could improve or even pain points. Sorry, the servers make the, <laughs> it's a bit slow to change slides. As said, I will go through four cases, um, events that have in one way or another managed to work with one of those areas really well. The first one I want to highlight is Dubrovnik Half Marathon. Beautiful creation event. And this turned up with the city really early on, and now they have created a tourist magnet. There's so many, um, I think it's up to 80% of all the participants are foreigners that go to the Bromley Calf Marathon. So what have done, they done really well? They turned up with the local tourist board from day one. And what they uh, did was that they didn't uh, see the event as just the event, they saw it as one part of a big vacation. So, and try to cater for all the other parts that is needed for a nice vacation, accommodation, things to do before the race, after the race and so on. Then they did one other clever thing. They targeted women in their advertising uh, since they often plan family holidays. So even if the participant was uh, the male uh, um, uh, partner in the family, they targeted women uh, for the advertising. So I thought it was pretty clever and it seemed to work really well. They managed to get families coming over for this uh, vacation. Um, then they also early on identified core markets and they saw that uh, the appetite for this type of race could be, uh, best appetite could be in for US and UK participants. And they did a strategy for each of those markets. And they did one more smart thing. They teamed up with the sister race in US and then uh, worked closely with them to cross promote, do cross promotion and be part of each other's event in a more visible way. And this helped them to tap into the US market on a fairly low marketing budget. One other was that has really done something special with the concept of going back to basics, so, so to say, and not being a premium race, but still offer a fantastic experience for international participants is Six Lakes Marathons in Sweden. They have really stuck to their rustic profile um, try to be 
not commercial at all, um, have an um, event area which is more close to the nature and, and feels very genuine. And they use the Swedish nature, which people, local people might take for granted and use that as part of the marketing. They also actually try to approach local expats and they saw them as a driver to open up other markets. And again, conveniency, even if it's a more low cost event or a more rustic event, they very early understood that they have to help the international runners maybe coming for the first time to Sweden. So they arrange bus transport for the closest city and give loads of information to these um, participants coming in from other countries. And then they also added a kids race and some child care services just to make sure that families also could join the event. And this event has been really successful, um, now attracting a large international audience and more impressively, they also get the internationals to come back year after year. Then we have one other organizer in Thailand that I would like to highlight, which is Telecal. Um, they have focused a lot on the real estate experience and try to understand the appeal of Thailand and, and integrate that really nicely with their events. Something they have done is to um, have a lot of focus on the post race experience. And when you read the reviews and hear from participants who've been there, they all talk about the fantastic Thai food that they have, that they got after the race. Um, and they also try to help participants a lot that come there. They, again, the convenience part, having bus transportation, giving some guidance on where to stay and so on. They also realize quickly that they need to broaden the offer a bit. Um, that's also a key learning. If you're very uh, niche and slim in your offer, you also have a smaller target group. So now they've added more distances and extended it to a race weekend. And that has helped them to attract an international audience where there might be a group that are attracted to different distances and different experience, and they can all find something they like. And they try to renew the race every year adding a gimmick, adding something new, um, just for the reason to communicate and refresh and build up the excitement. My last uh, case example come from Ireland, um, the fantastic Gendalo Lap of the Gap Marathon. What they have done really well um, and that you can learn a lot from is how they work with local businesses. When it comes to hotels, if you have an event in a really large city, it might not make sense to team up with hotels because people are quite used to booking hotels in, in other means and in, uh, for other medias. But when it comes to smaller events or when you, if your event takes place in a, in a region that has a more limited um, amount of accommodation, it's a great way to engage these accommodations and hotel in a better way. Not only to just partnering up and offering rooms, but actually communicating the needs of these participants that will come to, to stay with them. That they get up earlier in the morning, they might have different preference for breakfast. Um, this will make the whole experience um, much nicer for the participant and the hotel can also feel that they are on board with the event. Something that they also have done is to outsource lots of duties to local businesses. Instead of doing everything uh, themselves, they have tried to engage with both smaller one-man one show businesses and also local stores and local uh, restaurants. Uh, and this has given a very positive view of the event within the community. And that positive vibe is something that is also visible to the participants going to this event. 
transportation has been a key also for them and they also offer flexible pickup of start kits um, lots of guidance for um, overseas runners and they try to invest in um, the relationship with volunteers and credit them and highly value them and all in all they, they do a fantastic job in building that connection between the event and the community. So four really amazing events, but there are loads and loads of examples of uh, events out there doing great stuff for internationals and locals, of course, but uh, especially the international audience. There are three investment areas that I would like to stress um, that some events do not want to spend money on, or they might feel a bit uncomfortable, but this could be the real pain points when it comes to um, attracting internationals. The first one is content. If you think about uh, going to a country you might not have visited ever before, you go to a place that you haven't been to, you want to make sure it's a, it's a proper event and the marketing material becomes really important. So invest in a professional photographer, you will get that money back uh, very quickly because we can see a big difference especially on our platform on events that have invested in nice quality images versus events that are have maybe taken a few photos with uh, their mobile phone and uploaded those the second investment area or it's not really an investment it's more about time is to do pre-event communication this might not um, be a task that is really welcomed by not native speaking countries. And that's maybe why it's pushed to the bitter end that you send something. But it's really important to reassure the participants that they have signed up for an event that it does exist, that will take place, and that you help them with all the guidance. How to get there, where to pick up your start kit, maybe some local advice. Um, anything um, you can think about, put it in an email, translate it into English and send it out. It's better to have one really comprehensive email than forcing you to, yourself to do loads of different ones. And the third part is the customer support. When it comes to local runners, if you have a slow customer support, people might be annoyed. But when it comes to international runners, they can panic because they have, again, they have signed up to something that might be the first time that they join this event. And when they have questions and they do not get a reply, they get very worried. So try to get some help. If you don't have the tel help within your team or don't have a huge team, let in customer service, get someone to help you in this area. Last but not least, um, the main thing to attract internationals is to be, be unique. Everyone looks for a unique experience and you will find what is unique within your surroundings. Um, it can be your heritage, your local culture, the if you're in a beautiful location. And we use that. Sometimes we take things for granted just because we see it every day. But when we package it and communicate it to um, international participants, that's really something they bring with them. And as you mentioned, Chris, in the beginning with the fantastic event in Riga, the local dancers, that is something um, that is a key part of the Riga Marathon. It's also something that is, gets stuck in your mind. So. Think about those things um, and you will have a unique offer in the international market because no one else can replicate that. Great, that was all from, from me. I hope you found some, some uh, things useful and maybe it sparked an idea on, on things you can work on or things that you might need to improve within your race organization and I wish you all the best of luck in your preparations to prepare for internationals and yeah, happy to take some questions. Thanks very much, Charlotte. Um, 
maybe you want to just move on to oh there we are you've got your in touch slide there mm -hmm. um so there's a question here it's from someone who's remained anonymous but how far in advance do international participants typically book is there an indication of the peak booking period yeah it's of course different for different events but uh, on average is six months uh, on our platform six months yeah okay yes mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, please feel free to put some uh, any other comments that you have. I, there's a couple of things I picked up that I would uh, I would love to just touch on and, and maybe ask a couple of questions on, please, Charlotte. Um, what interesting for me that it doesn't have to be premium. I think that a lot of people have that perception that you need to create a, a premium event. But what came through in all of those case studies seem to be that importance of uniqueness, fusing in your local culture, your dancing, your whatever it may be. Uh, but that doesn't need to be a, a, a super, it obviously needs to be well organized, but it doesn't have to be premium. Mm, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think it also lowers the barrier because sometimes it can feel a bit overwhelming. Oh, how can we put up a, an event that attracts people from all over the world? But if you start to think about those things, like what makes you unique, what can we do within our community? Those events are really appreciated if they are carried out well. Yeah. You, you, you spoke of the event in Thailand, which renews every year with a gimmick. Have you got any examples of some of the gimmicks that work really well that other people might be able to copy in inverted commas? Yeah, for example, they have uh, given some prize money for uh, internationals uh, um, that can um, do some record time. Um, they have, there are some other events, not the Thailand events, but there, I know there are other events who have used influencers or more of a famous person that joins the event and they make a thing out of that. And that can also be a way to connect to a different market that you actually try to invite someone from a market where you feel that this is actually a group where we can get a larger audience and then they try to get a person from there and then they involve them in the event it doesn't have to be very costly either um, but just building a story uh, around the event that's a great one and, and i mean while you're touching on international markets you, you mentioned and there's a few more questions coming in there that you know they're targeting there were a couple of examples of targeting and and you know even targeting neighboring countries um hmm. I did some work with uh, Istanbul Marathon a couple of years ago. That was only last year. But one of the things we did is we worked out where the biggest Turkish diaspora was around the world. And, you know, the biggest population of Turkish people outside of Turkey was is in Germany. And then to really look at overlapping. So this year they went and did a, a booth at the Expo in Germany um, mm. and, and, you know, really targeting where... Um, you know, they're almost kind of preaching to the converted, so to speak. So, that you know, their people in another country might want to come back recommending them. So, uh, you know, that, that seemed to work well for them initially. So an idea for other people to, to maybe consider. Um, let me um, just go through here some of these other questions. Uh, it was actually one of my questions, but Tracy Sunderland stolen it from me. Do you need to communicate in multiple language or is only English sufficient? Um, it's it's better to focus on doing something really well in English because people usually have translation tools nowadays than overcomplicating it by translating it to many languages. The only difference if you have a huge uh, or huge, but a larger portion of participants coming from one particular market, then it might make sense to do a translated message, but then it'd have to be uh, a, a, maybe a returning segment that you always cater for. So now, for example, Stockholm Marathon has a, a large audience from Finland, and then they come back every year, and then they have special communication in Finnish. Um, but for the average race, uh, English is, is really enough. Thank you. And, and you, you spoke about the, the kind of written information. What about the need for on-ground translators? So, I mean, you spoke of large Finnish con contingent, I guess they maybe have some people on the ground, but what, what about a need to have people that are available at registration and packet pickup and so on that can can translate? Is How, how key is that? It's important to identify pain points uh, and, and that you can, if you put, if you try to put on the hat of being an international participant and really doing the journey of joining your event and then to try to see, identify key points where there can be confusion 
or the participant might get lost. Or it can be the simple as the last bus transportation, uh, where it can be really confusing which bus to choose or so. If you don't have the money to actually cater for uh, the bus, then you sh should invest in having volunteers that help. So, so try to find these pain points instead of having English speaking volunteers everywhere. So that's a quite big effort for, for a, a typical race. Yeah, that's great insight. Thank you. Um, Paolo Leite, uh, how do you see the value of a destination event versus a branded event? Point being the brand helps to sell the event, maybe? Question mark. Yeah, uh, of course, some brands are are really strong, uh, but they have also put uh, invested a lot of money to to build that brand. If you are an independent race, um, you might will most probably not have that kind of money to build that brand awareness. So then, using the destination and what you have locally might be a better strategy. But of course, uh, the 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 value of one doesn't take out the value of something of the the destination events and the branded events can really coexist and they are strong in their own grounds so to say thank you another one here from julia tree uh what are the top countries the users of art uh, uh, who are from so we have a very even spread throughout the world but the main user groups are americans and uh Brits. So they consist of 20% of our users, but the rest is the long tail of, I said, 195 niches. Thank you. Um, anonymous attendee again. Which countries' nationalities are spending the most on overseas races from your experience? Maybe that goes back to that same answer you just gave. You yeah, I, I, I get some kind of... But to be honest, uh, the if you look at this group of international, the international audience, they are pretty similar, independent of which country they come from. So even if they come from a country that might not uh, be um, on top uh, and really wealthy, they still are a wealthy group within that country. So the similarities, you cannot really see a group that spends more than than others in this particular audience. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Um, Paolo, later again, are you seeing a trend and success in digital assets versus regular merchandise, finisher t-shirts, medals, etc.? This might, this is actually not an area we have investigated that much. We, we try to keep our offer quite simple and not the, also let the organizer offer things on, on the side, maybe post uh, pre the race or on the race day. And we don't try to integrate everything on our side just to make it a very simple booking process. Um, so we haven't really analyzed that too much, to be honest. Maybe Chris, you can give some insights there. Yeah, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure either. I mean, I think there's definitely, um, you know, and, and we've got a we've got a um an environmental question coming up as well around carbon footprint. But I think more and more events are being aware of that. And I think you even in you know what people value, you highlighted the fact that it's the experience and it's not necessarily uh, the the monetary things. But mm -hmm. uh, from a digital perspective, I'm not not a hundred percent sure. I've seen uh, you know NFTs and that kind of thing in small amounts, but. Um, Carlo, I, I don't have any conclusive evidence to say that it's uh, that there's a massive growth in that space. I still see huge value in medals in many parts. Mm. T-shirts, definitely. I, I think that that's really becoming questionable um, from from the perspective of you know what what people like, uh, whether they end up being a, a dressing gown, a night a night shirt, maybe is a better better example. Um, and then people becoming much more aware of the environment environmental impact of those. So I think those are less appealing. But are they being replaced by digital assets? Yeah, certainly seeing you know stuff starting to happen in the NFT space, but not not a massive movement from what I can see. Um, Anonymous attendee again, I imagine the age demographic of international participants is higher given the costs involved. Do you have any info to support this? Yeah, it's definitely that way. So the main audience is 35 to 55. Um, it's, a, it's a large portion of the internationals. 
and uh, then they have slightly different needs again than maybe the average local runner. And when you say 45 to 55, that's maybe skewed towards running events or across the multitude of different types of endurance events you have? You know, I'm, I'm guessing that maybe the cycling demographic is a little bit older because people, yeah. people aren't able to run anymore, but... Yeah, yeah, you're right about that. Um, but again, it's a quite big investment. It's not only the investment, but also if you're younger, maybe you have uh, young kids, um, you cannot devote that much of your uh, time uh, to your hobby and travel. Maybe you do one trip a year with your friends and so, but you might get punished at home if you spend too much time on the road to just uh, discover new events when you have small kids. So um, the, it's a sweet spot when uh, the kids get a little bit older and, and again, you can devote time and, and money on and this. And it becomes a family holiday and, and more economic. Mm. More economic impact. And to Mark Turner's question, hello, Mark, good to see you. Um, the elephant in the room, we are pushing people to increase their carbon footprint at a time it's clear we should be reducing it. Best strategies yeah. for positively dealing with this rather than ignoring it. Yeah, of course. Uh, it's, it is a big topic. Um, though, I think what we want to try to push is to maybe have fewer fewer vacations rather than just going on low-cost airlines everywhere. You, you may be focusing and in investing in a few journeys that are really memorable for you and create a good impact, create a good impact for the, the community and so on. And something we would like to push a bit more is to other options of traveling. In Europe is quite nice, uh, the, the whole train, uh, train offering that might not be the same in other parts of the world, but it's, yeah, it's part of the bigger change that we need to offer alternatives to flights. Yeah, I think there's a the, the group from Swiss Runners. They've done a, a deal, if I'm correct, with Swiss Rail, where you can literally mm. present your bib and you get a chance uh, once you've entered. Your bib gives you free free travel to the event. But in any other strategies you've seen, I think Mark's kind of saying, not necessarily saying we don't want people coming to our events, but how do we deal with that? as event organizers, you know, is it carbon offset? Is it communication? What, what are some of the things and, and are there any examples, case studies of events you see doing it really well? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think events have tended to work on things that they can control, which is more waste management, how, how you do the, the, the local setup. And handling carbon off print so is quite tricky for a, a general smaller event. And that's why we maybe haven't seen any really impressive examples here. It would be nice if the bigger events actually could lead the way uh, and test some concepts that works. And in the airline industry, research shows that people are more uh, happy or more um, willing to pay for the carbon offset. So the trend really goes in that direction. And uh, yeah. Yeah, so I guess what you're saying, give give people the opportunity um, to be able to offset uh, rather than necessarily expect them to do it themselves. Yeah, and also maybe not put too much burden on a race organizer because you cannot solve every problem out there. And and also the events have lots of positive impact um, when it comes to education um, in the local community many Asian events like just picking up plastic and trash and so on after the course that's a really positive impact overall on, on the more holistic view of sustainability so trying to focus on these things and if you could add a carbon offset of course, of course nothing wrong is something good but uh, it can also be a bit overwhelming when you want to solve everything as a single event organizer but I hope that we can see examples of bigger events, which maybe have a little bit more resources to test concepts and see what actually works here. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, another one from Paolo. Uh, do you have a view of markets that are growing in mass participation events and participants and what markets are shrinking? Meaning when looking to promote a race internationally, which are the best markets to invest in promotion wise? Um, what's the question where the participants comes from or where where the events take place? Uh, 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Paolo, maybe you'd like to follow that up. You, you, I think you're looking from where participants are coming from, but I think you're maybe also asking which destinations are growing and may, maybe what you're meaning there, if there's, for example, if there's countries in Eastern Europe that are growing in terms of putting on events, sooner or later, those people are going to want to travel and and, and they and they might be targets for another event. Let's let's give Paolo a couple of minutes to respond to that as we go down to Rolly. Hello, Rolly Kayumba joining us from Congo River Marathon. Wonderful to see you. Is there a time of the year where international participants travel the most to the events? Um. We can at least we can say they, they follow the they follow the same trend as events in general, but the key difference is the booking time where they when they try to uh, find the events for next year and they try in general to uh, um, get the plan for the upcoming year quite early, which means that we have a peak for bookings for the next year in October and early November when they uh, really plan the next year's bigger events. But then when it comes to participation, it, it follows the general calendar. But it's really important to, if you want to approach an international audience, I can't stress it enough, but start to communicate in time. And also think about it a little bit long-term that even the, if you take, make a lot of effort this year, you might see the effect in not the upcoming edition, but the edition after that, because it also takes time for people to, okay, discover that the event takes place, learn about the event, and then have it in back of their mind. And then it's a suitable timing to go there, maybe not uh, the upcoming edition, but the edition after. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, Karan. No, it's, it's more of a long-term investment. Uh, but it pays off because usually when you start to get internationals um, and you have a good event that they appreciate, the, um, you get referrals and positive reviews. And yeah, the word tend to spread quickly. Thank you. Um, Christian's got a good point. He said, can you t uh, put your slide off so we can see you bigger on the oh, screen? Okay. <laughs> right. There we are. Let's see both of us there now. Um, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, so going back to Paolo. So yeah, I think Paolo was making that same point. So where are the growing markets that you're seeing more events popping up that uh, potentially are going to become future travelers? Uh, and maybe any markets that are shrinking? Um, and, uh, you know, if you're looking to promote your race, where where would you target um, your, your, in, your investment if you've got limited investment, I guess you're saying, Paolo? Mm. Um, well, I, I will go back to the point of maybe starting off at least regional, uh, like in the, in the sense of looking at your own continent and see which are the, the countries that uh, where you have direct flights coming in and so on. You can fairly quickly see where your target audience most probably are. Uh, and then when it comes to um, the markets that are shrinking and uh, increasing, UK and US participants, they are great, great audience always. They, they uh, like to explore the world and they tend to travel both to Europe. We have seen a trend in going to Africa to events there, Southeast Asia and so on. Um, there are some markets that do really, that are coming back after COVID and the events are kicking off, but we don't see the influx of internationals. So China is one of that ex example of that. Um, US maybe as well, that the market is coming back, but internationals have not started to come yet to the events. So a little bit slower there. Also Southeast Asia used to be an extremely popular destination for, for foreign runners, but now it's been a little bit slow this year, but hopefully that will change. And maybe it can be still an effect of the COVID. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, got, I think last one here. We've, we've got about three or four minutes left. So if anyone's got any last questions, please pop them in. Uh, you might have covered that in your last one, but let me read Mark's question. Are Americans traveling more to sports events in Europe than before? It's my impression, uh, the data that I have. Would, would you back up Mark's thoughts? Yeah, it's a it's very large and growing audience. And there's, uh, yeah, they, they really value the events as well. Well, which is nice like you when you said the reviews you hear the feedback they uh, are generally very positive towards 
these European niche events that they find. And, and it's amazing if you, especially if you're a smaller event and uh, as Six Lakes, to take that example again, that have managed to capture an American audience. And now they can grow that. It's amazing. You're, it's just a small event in, in Sweden and they have still captured an audience that is growing and helping them to sustain growth within the event. Thank you, Charlotte. We are literally almost bang on time. I think we've got one minute, so perfectly managed. Thank you for putting all those great questions into the end yeah. um, for, for the audience. Thanks, everyone attending. Uh, we were talking before we came on air that we might make these uh, these maybe on an ongoing basis. So if, uh, if you found this valuable, if you've got any particular topics that you would like us to cover that you think Charlotte and world's uh, sports groups can help you with please uh, let us know um you know how to contact me if you don't chris at mass participation um charlotte's email was on the on the end on that last slide which was up for long enough for i'm sure you to see but uh, we'll be sending out um the the recording and the slides and um uh, obviously always here to help you uh, a reminder again as i say it's been live streamed on facebook so if you're impatient to get the recording you can get that off the mass participation world facebook page straight after this or point your friends to it some of those stats quickly so um interestingly um only 36 percent of people on the call have a an international participant strategy um only um 44 percent percent train their participants uh to i mean their staff to deal with participants and un unsurprised international participants and unsurprisingly um support from uh, tourism was relatively low across the board only four percent uh, getting cash from national bodies, 8% in kind. Cash from local was 15%, in kind 30%, and 59% no, no support at all. So maybe that's opportunities. Maybe I know it yeah. is difficult, but maybe it's opportunities to go and tap on, uh, on those doors. But um, again, thank you to all of you for tuning in. As I said, we had over 200 people registered. I think at our peak, we were 63 or so on the call and the rest of them will be looking for the recording huge thank you again charlotte melchard who's the founder and ceo of uh, world sports group thanks for those valuable insights charlotte thank you thank you so much for for setting this up with us wonderful to partner with you and uh, again i'm chris rob i'm the ceo and founder of mass participation world Delighted to see so many familiar names. Uh, look forward to hopefully seeing some of you in three weeks' time in Ho Chi Minh City for the eighth edition of Mass Participation World. Um, remember that there is a $50 discount uh, from tonight's call if you're interested. But uh, yeah, thanks again for joining us. Have a wonderful evening, uh, rest of the day, morning, wherever you're tuning in from, and we'll see you around somewhere soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Charlotte. Great, thanks.